Hello, and welcome to the virtual and in-person AWP Conference and Book Fair. I'm Sean Bernard, a member of the AWP Board of Directors. For accessibility, I'd like to offer a physical description of myself. I'm a white man with dark hair. I'm wearing a gray sports coat and a black t-shirt with the word Sonora Town written on it. It's a very great restaurant in Los Angeles. We are delighted to bring you this event today, celebrating the National Book Critics Circle's first book award. It's featuring Raven Leilani, Carmen Maria Machado, and Kirsten Valdez Quaid, and is moderated by David Barno. AWP's literary partners and sponsors allow us to present these extraordinary literary events and help us keep our conference affordable and accessible. So thank you to all of our conference sponsors and partners for their support and participation. This conversation was pre-recorded and is premiering on Friday, March 25th from 3.20 to 4.35 p.m. Eastern Time. After the conclusion of the event, it will be available for on-demand viewing. During the event's premiere, please enter your questions or comments into the platform chat box on the right of the screen. If you're watching on demand, feel free to continue to leave comments in the chat box to the right of the video. We thank you so much for attending and for your continued support of AWP. We hope you enjoy the conference and we hope you enjoy this event. Thank you. Welcome writers, publishers, teachers, readers, and all AWP attendees, and thank you for joining us for a reading celebrating the, the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Award. My name is David Varno, and I'm the president of the MBCC. I'm deeply honored to be here as moderator for this event featuring Raven Lalani, Carmen Maria Machado, and Kirsten Valdez Quaid, each of whose debut books arrived fully formed over the past several, several years and are not going anywhere. The two collections and the novel are all deeply imagined, perfectly crafted, and bravely challenging acts of genius. I would like to thank AWP for partnering with the MBCC and our VP of events, Jane Chabatari, for envisioning today's program. The National Book Critics Circle honors outstanding writing and fosters a national conversation about reading, criticism, and literature. It was founded in 1974 by a group of book critics, including John Leonard, Nona Balakian, and Ivan Sandroff. In 2013, the MBCC gave its inaugural John Leonard Award for a first book in any genre to Anthony Mara. Other winners include Phil Cly, Ya Jesse, Tommy Orange, and Sarah Broom. The MBCC continues to develop new awards with the inaugural Toni Morrison Prize for Literary Achievement going this year to the Cave Conum Foundation. Next year, the MBCC will present the first annual Greg Barrios Prize for a work in translation in honor of our late board member. We invite all of you in attendance in Philadelphia to visit the MBCC at Book Fair Table 951. You can, you can also learn more about our programs and how to join the MBCC as a working book critic or student by visiting our website at bookcritics.org. Now, I would like to introduce our readers in alphabetical order. Raven Lalani's work has been published in Granta, The Yale Review, and The Cut, among other publications. Lalani is a National Book Foundation 5 under 35 honoree, the recipient of the 2020 Kirkus Prize, Dylan Thomas Prize, BCU Cabell Prize, NBCC John Leonard Prize, and the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. Luster is her first novel. Carmen Maria Machado is the author of the best-selling memoir, In the Dream House, the award-winning short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties, and the graphic novel, The Low, Low Woods. She has been a finalist for the National Book Award and the winner of the Bard Fiction Prize, the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Fiction, the Lambda Literary Award for LGBTQ Nonfiction, the, book, the Brooklyn Public Library Literature Prize, the Shirley Jackson Award, and the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Prize. In 2018, the New York Times listed her body and other parties as a member of the New Vanguard, one of 15 remarkable books by women that are shaping the way we read and write fiction in the 21st century. Her essays, fiction, and criticism have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Granta, Vogue, this American Life, Harper's Bazaar, Tin House, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, The Believer, Guernica, Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, Best American Non-Required Reading and Elsewhere, 
She holds a, an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop and has been awarded fellowships and residencies from the Guggenheim Foundation, Yaddo, Hedgebrook, and the Malay Co Colony for the Arts. She lives in Philadelphia. Kirsten Valdez Quaid is the author of The Five Wounds, winner of the Center for Fiction's first novel prize. It is shortlisted for the Penn Hemingway Award and the Carnegie Medal for Excellence, and is currently longlisted for the Aspen Words Literary Prize. The Five Wounds was named the best book of 2021 by NPR, PBS NewsHour, Publishers Weekly, Kirkus Reviews, Library Journal, Book List, and Book Riot. Her short story collection, Night at the Fiestas, won the John Leonard Prize for the National Book Credit Circle, the Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a five under 35 award from the National Book Foundation, and was a finalist for the New York Public Library Young Lions Award. It was named a New York Times Notable Book and a Best Book of 2015 by the San Francisco Chronicle and the American Library Association. Kirsten is the recipient of a Lannan Fellowship, the John Guar Writers Fund Rome Prize from the American Academy in, in Rome, a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award, a grant from the Elizabeth George Foundation, and a Stegner Fellowship at Stanford. Her, book is, her work has appeared in the, in the New Yorker, The Best American Short Stories, The O. Henry Prize Stories, The New York Times, and elsewhere. She teaches at Princeton. Okay, thank you all of you for being here. Um, I thought that since this event is focused on your debuts, uh, that we could begin more or less at the beginning. Um, could you all talk about how these books came to be and how long it took to write them and, and, and how much did the final product evolve into a, a different place from the original vision? Um, well, for me, I, I wrote this book uh, in my MFA program. I had come in uh, to the program with an entirely different book uh, and it was probably the second book that I that I'd written, and I and I hoped that it would be the book. Um, but then, as I was, uh, <laughs> I started having conversations with my cohort and uh, the teachers that would become my mentors, and they asked me questions that I I suppose I should have thought <laughs> about while I was writing my draft, um, but that I thought about more deeply, um, and kind of forced me to to start over. Um, so that is sort of where this book began. Um, I, I kind of always say in a panic because I can talk about it like calmly now, but I do remember that, you know, that day going home, looking at my draft and, and realizing I, I could mean it more, you know? Um, and so that's where, where this book came from. Um, and it took about uh, a year to write. Um, and I was working full time while I was in grad school. Um, so I kind of wrote at night after I uh, got out of class and out of work. And so for me, I feel like I didn't have a chance to um, to let too much anxiety in because <laughs> I just had a very a small window of hours to write. And so it just kind of, it came out, um, the most urgent form of it kind of came out um, naturally. I feel like my book was also like half grad school panic. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a common theme. Um, you know, I came to my graduate program like not knowing what I was doing, like truly on like a fundamental level. Like I was like, I can write a good sentence, but like I didn't know what I was interested in or what I wanted to be writing about. And I remember a classmate giving me a note kind of early on being like, you seem bored by the story you've submitted. Um, and I was like, oh, blunt. <laughs> but I think true, actually. Um, and so I remember like kind of having this like series and people were like, but you, you should be reading like, try this person, try this person. So I was like reading much of stuff and, and suddenly found myself like really thinking a lot about genre and like the kind of the rest is history. And so I began to like, I kind of also started over and like, started writing new work that I found exciting. And it did feel like something was correct. Like it like in my brain, I was like, oh, this feels like the right project. So the book that became Her Body and Other Parties was my thesis for grad school. But even finishing school, the thesis and the final collection only have three overlapping stories. So basically, I like had a thesis, gave it that title, 
And then after grad school, went back and like took every story out that I didn't love. And I was left with three stories. And then I was like, okay, now I'm going to like add stories to the collection that feel like they're in conversation with like the stories that are, have remained, which are sort of, you know, thematically around like, you know, bodies and gender and sexual violence and all these things. And so, um, and so, yeah, so I just sort of like, uh, uh, went through and just kind of kept adding until the book felt done and felt complete. Um, but yeah, also I feel like that, that kind of like that moment of just being like, oh, I need to do something completely different than what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like very, it's like very real to me as well. Um, so I'm glad I, I see that. <laughs> yeah, I acknowledge that. <clears throat> yeah. My collection also started, um, in graduate school. I think the first story, um, I applied to graduate school with, um, and, um, wrote several of the other stories in graduate school, as, along with a bunch of others that didn't make it into the book. Um, and, and I continued writing at the, um, two years after, you know, I was, I was still, um, writing new stories and, and, doing tons and tons of revision um after graduate school so um yeah and you know i i it became pretty clear to me that i um am just really really interested in um new mexico where my family's from and um the the history of the place and the sort of um the history that still feels really alive today. Um, and um, so I had this idea that the book would be about uh, trying to look at this place that matters so much to me through a bunch of different lenses. Um, and that's more or less what the what the book ended up being. Um, I, well, although like Carmen, I also, I pulled, I pulled a bunch out of um, my, graduate thesis um and and put a bunch of news stories in and yeah there's something so liberating about just yanking a story that's not that's not working or or you know a scene or whole chapters um you know just cutting it it's it's the best feeling so <laughs> um I think this is a great place to to start hearing from from each of you read from your work now that we've gotten a little background and in, in the story behind, behind the stories. Um, Raven, we'll start with you and then Carmen and then Kirsten. Great. Um, I figured I would just start straight from the beginning. It, you know, it requires no prefacing. The first time we have sex, we are both fully clothed at our desk during working hours, bathed in blue computer light. He is uptown processing a new bundle of microfiche and I'm downtown handling corrections for new Labrador detective manuscript. He tells me what he ate for lunch and asks if I can manage to take off my underwear and my cubicle without anyone noticing. His messages come with impeccable punctuation. He is fond of words like taste and spread. The empty text field is full of possibilities. Of course, I worry about IT remoting into my computer or my internet history warranting yet another meeting with HR, but the risk, the thrill of a third pair of unseen eyes the idea that some in the office with that sweet post-lunch break optimism might come across the thread and see how tenderly Eric and I have built this private world. In his first message, he points out a few typos in my online profile and tells me he has an open marriage. His profile pictures are candid and loose, a grainy photo of him asleep in the sand, a photo of him shaving, taken from behind. It is his last photo that moves me, the dirty tile and soft recession of steam, his face in the mirror, stern with quiet scrutiny, I save the photo to my phone so I can look at it on the train. Women look over my shoulder and smile and I let them believe he is mine. Otherwise, I have not had much success with men. This is not a statement of self-pity. This is just a statement of the facts. Here's a fact. I have great breasts which have warped my spine. More facts. My salary is very low. I have trouble making friends and men lose interest in me when I talk. It always goes well initially when I talk too explicitly about my ovarian torsion or my rent. Eric is different. Two weeks into our correspondence, he tells me about the cancer that ravaged half his maternal family. He tells me about the aunt he loved who made potions with fox hair and hemp, how she was buried with a corn husk doll she made of herself. Still, he describes his childhood home lovingly, the digressions of farmland between Milwaukee and Appleton, the yellow-breasted chats and tundra swans that would appear in his yard looking for seed. When I talk about my childhood, I only talk about the happy parts. 
the tape of spiced roll that I received for my fifth birthday, the Barbie I melted in the microwave when no one was home. Of course, the context of my childhood, the boy bands, the Lunchables, the impeachment of Bill Clinton only emphasizes our generational gap. Eric is sensitive about his age and about mine and makes a considerable effort to manage the 23 year discrepancy. He follows me on Instagram and leaves lengthy comments on my posts. Retired internet slang interspersed with earnest remarks about how the light falls on my face. Compared to the inscrutable advances of younger men, it is a relief. We talk for a month before our schedules align. We try to meet earlier, but things always come up. This is just one way his life is different from mine. There are people who count on him, and sometimes they need him urgently. Between his abrupt cancellations, I realize that I need him too, in a way that makes my dreams delirious expressions of thirst, long stretches of yellow desert, cathedrals hemmed in dripping moss. By the time we set our first real date, I would have done anything. He wanted to go to Six Flags. We decided to go on a Tuesday. When he rolls up in his white Volvo, I've only made it to the part of my pre-date routine where I try to find the most appropriate laugh. I put on three dresses before I find the right one. I tie up my braids and line my eyes. There are dishes in the sink and a pervasive salmon smell in the apartment, and I don't want him to think it has anything to do with me. I put on a complex pair of underwear that is not so much underwear as a bundle of string, and I stand before the mirror. I think to myself, you are a desirable woman. You are not a dozen gerbils in a skin casing. Outside, he is double parked. He leans against the car and remains like this as I come out, his eyes bright and still. His hair is darker than I expected, a black so opaque it looks blue. His face is almost obscenely symmetrical, the one of his eyebrows is higher than the other, and it makes his smile seem a little smug. It is the second day of summer, and all the city's powers have no sway over him. I reach for his hand, trying not to swallow my tongue, and something feels strange. Of course, there are nerves. In person, he's a total daddy, his face alert and hard, softened only by the slight recession of his hair. But this strange feeling has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with me looking past his sensuous mouth and slightly askew nose for any indication that he is as nervous as I am. It is that it is 8.15 a.m. and I feel happy. I'm not on the L smelling someone's lukewarm pickles, wishing I were dead. Edie, I say, extending my hand. I know, he says, his long fingers settling between mine too gently. I wanted to be more forward, to fold him into an easy extroverted hug, but what happens is this limp handshake, this aversion of my eyes, this unsurprising and immediate surrender of power, and then the worst part of meeting a man in broad daylight, the part where you see him seeing you, deciding in the split second whether any future cunnilingus will be enthusiastic or perfunctory. He opens the door and there is a fluffy blue dye hanging from the rearview mirror, a half bag of Jolly Ranchers in the passenger seat. His correspondence online has been honest, full of his stuttering sincerity, However, as we have already told the stories you might tell in a first date, it is harder to begin. He brings up the weather, and then we are talking about climate change. After a while of talking generally about burning to death, we pull into the park. Okay, I'll stop there. I am going to be reading from uh, Her Body and Other Parties, uh, from the first story in the collection, The Husband's Stitch. If you read this story out loud, please use the following voices. Me, as a child, high-pitched, forgettable. As a woman, the same. The boy who will grow into a man and be my spouse, robust with serendipity. My father, kind, booming, like your father, or the man you wish was your father. My son, as a small child, gentle, sounding with the faintest of lisps, as a man like my husband. All other women, interchangeable with my own. In the beginning, I know I want him before he does. This isn't how things are done, but this is how I am going to do them. I am at a neighbor's party with my parents and I am 17. I drink half a glass of white wine in the kitchen with a neighbor's teenage daughter. My father doesn't notice. Everything is soft, like a fresh oil painting. The boy is not facing me. I see the muscles of his neck and upper back, how he fairly strains out of his button down shirts like a day laborer dressed up for a dance and I run slick. 
and it isn't that I don't have choices. I am beautiful. I have a pretty mouth. I have breasts that heave out of my dresses in a way that seems innocent and perverse at the same time. I am a good girl from a good family. But he is a little craggy in that way men sometimes are, and I want. He seems like he could want the same thing. I once heard a story about a girl who requested something so vile from her paramour that he told her family and they had her hauled off to a sanitarium. I don't know what deviant pleasure she asked for, though I desperately wish I did. What magical thing could you want so badly they take you away from the known world for wanting it? The boy notices me. He seems sweet, flustered. He says, hello. He asks my name. I have always wanted to choose my moment, and this is the moment I choose. On the deck, I kiss him. He kisses me back, gently at first, but then harder, and he pushes open my mouth a little with his tongue, which surprises me, and I think perhaps him as well. I have imagined a lot of things in the dark, in my bed, beneath the weight of that old quilt, but never this, and I moan. When he pulls away, he seems startled. His eyes dart around for a moment before settling on my throat. What's that? He asks. Oh, this? I touch the ribbon at the back of my neck. It's just my ribbon. I run my fingers halfway around its green and glossy length and bring them to rest on the tight bow that sits in the front. He reaches out. Uh, <laughs> uh, he reaches out his hand and I seize it and press it away. You shouldn't touch it, I say. You can't touch it. Before we go inside, he asks if he can see me again. I tell him I would like that. That night before I sleep, I imagine him again, his tongue pushing open my mouth, and my fingers slide over myself, and I imagine him there, all muscle and desire to please, and I know that we are going to marry. We do. I mean, we will. But first he takes me in his car, in the dark, to a lake with a marshy edge that is hard to get close to. He kisses me and clasps his hand around my breast, my nipple nodding beneath his fingers. I am not truly sure what he is going to do before he does it. He is hard and hot and dry and smells like bread, and when he breaks me, I scream and cling to him like I am lost at sea. His body locks onto mine, and he is pushing, pushing, and before the end, he pulls himself out and finishes with my blood slicking him down. I am fascinated and aroused by the rhythm, the concrete sense of his need, the clarity of his release. Afterward, he slumps in the seat and I can hear the sounds of the pond, loons and crickets, and something that sounds like a banjo being plucked. The wind picks up off the water and cools my body down. I don't know what to do now. I can feel my heart beating between my legs. It hurts, but I imagine it could feel good. I run my hand over myself and feel strains of pleasure from somewhere far off. His breathing becomes quieter, and I realize that he is watching me. My skin is glowing beneath the moonlight coming through the window. When I see him looking, I know I can seize that pleasure, like my fingertips tickling the very end of a balloon string that has almost drifted out of reach. I pull and moan and write out the crest of sensation slowly and evenly, biting my tongue all the while. I need more, he says, but he does not rise to do anything. He looks out the window, and so do I. Anything could move out there in the darkness, I think. A hook-handed man, a ghostly hitchhiker, forever repeating the same journey. An old woman summoned from the repose of her mirror by the chance of children. Everyone knows these stories. That is, everyone tells them, even if they don't know them. But no one ever believes them. His eyes drift over the water and then return to me. Tell me about your ribbon, he says. There's nothing to tell. It's my ribbon. May I touch it? No. I want to touch it, he says. His fingers twitch a little and I close my legs and sit up straighter. No. Something in the lake muscles and writhes out of the water and then lands with a splash. He turns at the sound. 
A fish, he says. Sometime, I tell him, I will tell you the stories about this lake and her creatures. He smiles at me and rubs his jaw. A little of my blood smears across his skin, but he doesn't notice and I don't say anything. I would like that very much, he says. Take me home, I tell him, and like a gentleman, he does. That night, I wash myself. The silky suds between my legs are the color and scent of rust, but I am newer than I have ever been. Thank you. What a treat to hear Raven and Carmen read um, from their books. I love those books so much. Um, I'm going to read the opening of the short story, Ordinary Sins, from my collection, Night at the Fiestas. Last night, Crystal dreamed she was sitting naked on the corduroy rectory couch next to Father Paul, who was snipping at her fingers with orange-handled scissors. In the dream, she was holding a prayer card on which was printed, in place of a saint, a still from her sonogram. She felt stinging cuts on her knuckles and in the webbing between her fingers, saw the warm blood running down her wrists and beating on the laminated surface of the card. But she neither cried for help nor tried to get away. She was pinned to the couch by her pregnant belly. If the dream hadn't been so unsettling, it might have been almost comical, Crystal thought now, Monday morning, as she updated the calendar of events for Our Lady of Seven Sorrows. Father Paul, so benign and solicitous and eager for approval in waking life, starring as the villain in her dream. She glanced down at her fingers, typing intact. If she were to tell Father Paul about her dream, though she wouldn't tell him anything about her life ever again, he'd be concerned and apologetic as if it weren't Crystal's own warped brain that had cast him in the scene. Even the thought of his concern irritated her. Any minute, Father Paul would walk into the office, and when he did, she'd smile as if everything were just fine. Impressive how efficiently her subconscious tallied, dismantled, and blended together her sins, molding them all into a tidy and disturbing little narrative as persistent and irksome as pine sap. First, on Friday, she'd been rude to Father Paul. Then, on Saturday, she'd gone to a party at a condo in a new development west of town with friends from Santa Fe High, and had spent the evening sipping from other people's drinks. That was bad enough. But she'd also left with someone, a friend of a friend, ridden back to his apartment in his truck, knowing full well that he was drunk but not feeling an ounce of concern for the babies or for herself. I've never fucked a pregnant girl, the guy had said softly, watching from the bed in his filthy bedroom as she pulled down her maternity jeans. He'd been cautious and attentive, and for as long as it lasted, Crystal had felt deeply sexy and, for the first time in seven months, unburdened. Only at dawn, once she'd slipped out into the chill and was waiting for a cab on an unfamiliar street in a tired trucks-on-blocks kind of neighborhood, did it occur to her to worry that the, about the babies, that they'd been squished or knocked around, polluted by his fluids. And Crystal might have been murdered, too, strangled, shot, beaten beyond recognition. Wasn't murder the leading cause of death for pregnant women? With a pang of dismay, she thought of her last checkup. She'd been given a 3D ultrasound, the latest in prenatal imaging, the technician told her, which they were offering free because they were still training on the machine. The images were terrifying and unreal. Boy and girl, fists and ears and pursed lips, bent legs stringy with tendons, alien eyes swollen shut. Everything looked yellow and cold and shiny, as if dipped in wax. Say hello to your cuties, the technician had said and Crystal had watched in silence as they pulsed on the screen. But today the baby seemed great, kicking up a storm, and she hadn't been murdered. Saturday had been nothing more than a last hurrah, Crystal reminded herself, a harmless attempt to pretend that her life was still her own. Looked at another way, the dream was even reassuring. At least Crystal felt guilt. At least she might think twice next time. Yes, everything was fine, and it was even nice to be back at work, away from her weekend and her nightmare, in the close clutter of the parish office, where the day was predictable, the tasks manageable, where, in theory at any rate, earnest, hopeful work was taking place all around her. Meanwhile, the real Father Paul was late yet again, this time for his eight o'clock premarital counseling appointment. A young couple sat on the couch facing Colette's desk. 
The man plucked at one of his sideburns with sullen impatience. The girl sat upright and glanced nervously at him. Every few minutes, Colette looked up from folding the weekly bulletins and glared. From her desk in the corner, Crystal sipped her Diet Coke and watched. Colette's bad temper was democratic in its reach, and when it wasn't directed at Crystal, could be very entertaining. Once, when they were alone in the office, Colette had startled her by pausing at her desk and saying darkly that Crystal was an example to young women choosing life. For a moment, Crystal had seen herself as Colette might, a tragic figure, a fallen woman, but when it came down to it, contrite and virtuous, taking responsibility for her mistake. But then Colette had elaborated, if you girls are going to run around like that, you should pay. The young man opened his cell phone, then snapped it shut. 8.57, he said, Jesus, I got work to do. He'll be here, the girl said. She looked at Crystal and gave her a miserable, apologetic smile. She dressed for the appointment. Her hair was down, sprayed into crispy waves around her face. A gold cross hung from her neck. Crystal imagined she would dug it out so that Father Paul would think she was a virgin, which was what Crystal herself had done when she took the job two years ago. Thank you. I'll stop there. Those are all such great readings. Thank you all so much. But what, what a treat, like Kirsten said. Um, I, I thought I would go, go back to something that um, that Carmen brought up earlier, and we were talking about um, the the stories behind behind these books. Um, you mentioned something about you know be, being given books to read and 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 finding some paths to go down, and of course, as you said, the rest is history. Um, I, I'm you know thinking about the fact that that each of you in these books are are, are really writing about the body and the realities of, of, of living in the body sometimes described in in a kind of hyper realist or or even fantastical way um, with burdens and desires and mortality and and, and so many themes of, of transformation in various ways um, wonder if you could talk about how you how you arrived there in in the way that that you did um, through, through your literary influences? Were, were there examples, books that you read, um, ambitions that you that you had? I'm really, really curious about that. Um, I was reading, uh, while I was writing, I was reading a lot of Mary Gateskill. Um, someone had given me a few, um, a few Otessa Moshfag books. Um, and I hadn't, I hadn't yet read Sula, so I was reading Sula. Um, and, but as in terms of like the writing of it, um, I almost feel like that uh, hyper attention to the body. I I couldn't have writ written it any other any other way. It kind of came out of me that way. Uh, as specifically, you know, um, Edie, she's a character. She has like a lot of bodily drama happening, <laughs> even as she's going about life, and um, I. I, it was important for me to put those two things side by side, and that they be both, they both have as much presence on the page as, as her, you know, her, what her workday is like. Um, that, that maintenance of the body that we, I think we're made to feel is private or made to feel is um, disgusting, <laughs> that that also uh, have a lot of real estate in the book. Um, uh, and also just the, there's this moment um, that I wanted to write because I, I drew from some jobs that I, I'd had in real life and um, she's out on her route delivering food and there is this sense of she's, she's on her grind and she's moving from place to place to place um, trying to make enough money to, to live and pay rent, but she still has to contend with these sort of external threats. Her body is still imperiled in a way that informs how she can move um, even though that isn't at the moment like her most the most pressing <laughs> the most pressing threat um, is not having enough money but at the same time she's trying to um, she's doing all of the all the calculations she has to do in order to kind of evade these threats of like men along along her route so the presence of the body is there partly because it is um, I mean it's present it's present for her and it's present for us constantly um, and I want to do 
I want to do work. And, and those are the parts of the body that are, <laughs> you know, those are the parts of the body that that are like kind of, um, I'm not talking about the pleasurable, pleasurable parts. And I think that's important too, but I, I did want to, I wanted those parts that were meant to kind of, um, that are meant to be, that were conditioned to make private I wanted those to be public. You know, I wanted those to that to take up space as well. Um, <clears throat> so I feel like for me, I mean, yeah, like the body is sort of at the center of like most of what I do. I think because I experience so much of my own life and even my own thoughts, like sort of through the lens of sort of tactile sensation and through sort of moving my body through the world. Um, and I think, and also just existing in like a politicized body, um, which I think, you know, also sort of is a way of like shaping and thinking about like what kind of stories you want to write or like, I mean, that's like such a central sort of piece of it. And so, yeah. So when I was sort of beginning this process, I remember like obviously reading a lot of work, you know, I feel like right now, like the sort of the fabulism and experimental writing that's getting written is being done almost exclusively by women. Um, and it's been like incredibly exciting. So I was reading a lot of work that made me sort of, that in which the body was sort of interestingly framed in like a sort of liminal or, hor or horrific or fantastic way. So writer, writers like, I really was reading a lot of, you know, Kelly Link and Karen Russell and Helen Uyemi and was like thinking a lot about sort of like where the body exists, the female body especially, sort of in these sort of fabulous structures or horror structures. Um, and then also I was sort of at the, on the same, at the same time thinking a lot about sex and about the writing of sex and like kind of the role that that, that, that plays. And I was reading, I remember obviously having my mind blown by like Angela Carter and reading The Bloody Chamber and being like, oh my God, like, you know, it's a word, it's like every sentence like drips with sex and like, you know, sort of the, there's something so just like profoundly erotic at like every turn. And I was like, I got, I want to write like that, or I want to, you know, and that, that was something that was like really important to me. And I, I remember like, it's like funny. Cause like a lot of people would recommend books to me to be like, Oh, here's like a novel about sex. And it would be like, you know, James Salter or Philip Roth, all of whom like, you know, had, you know, or Nicholson Baker. But I was like, I mean, this is interesting to me, but also I really can, I'm really interested in like, where is like the female version of this? Where's the queer version of this? Like, I really want to be like thinking about bodies in this way and sex in this way. Cause it just seems so, it just seems so important to me. Um, so yeah. So that was sort of the beginning of that, of that process, I guess. You know, I can think of so many um, writers I was reading at the time and who who left their mark on this book. Um, Alice Munro, Rudolfo Anaya, um, Flannery O'Connor. Um, I mean, lots and lots of writers. Um, the the but somehow I'm not. It, it it's not their writing about the bodies that were most most um, inspiring to me. Um, I think, you know, when I'm, as a reader, when I'm reading about characters' bodies, that's, that's the invitation to, you know, enter their skin and to inhabit their worlds. And I think the same is true for me as a writer. It's how I get to know my characters. I don't, I don't know who they are, um, until until I know how they move through the world and what what their bodies feel like and how they they sense the world, um, so I think to to a great extent, it's it's um, you know when whenever I feel like I'm losing touch with a character or I don't know where the the scene is going, um, returning to the character's body is is always a Good way to remind myself of who this person is and what what the story is, and um, yeah, and that gives me just what I need to you know get to the next the next through the next paragraph. Great, thanks thanks for those answers. It's really really fascinating. Um, let's talk about publishing. Um, really curious about what your first experiences were like, both with publishing. A story and also with your first books um, and what you've learned since then. Well, I I was I worked in publishing and was working in publishing as I was writing this book. 
um, and I, I worked on the archival side. So I, I was seeing what was coming in from all of the imprints and every book that came in, I would, I would look at it, you know, and, and see what <laughs> I was really, really um, invested in understanding that side of things. Um, but before, even before that, um, I was, you know, I started in, in poetry and, and then moved into writing short fiction for a while. Um, publishing to me was uh, trying to get my work um, into literary journals that I really loved. Um, and, and they were the first um, outlets that really like uplifted me and made me feel like I could keep going. But it, it was my first, my first real um, experience with what I think is a huge part of publishing, which is rejection. You know, I, I was submitting constantly, submitting my, my stories um, and my poetry. And um, I feel like I, I remember how it felt in the very beginning. Um, you, the first thing you submit you think is perfect and it will land somewhere. Um, and I, after you submit for a while and you kind of figure out how to, um, how to take things back and revise as you go. Uh, that was, that was hugely important in, in how I went about, um, that side of things, uh, was I spent like five or, you know, how many years, um, just writing, and submitting and and kind of collecting rejections and and then taking things back and tweaking them and re just living in um, revision. Um, with uh, publishing uh, publishing this book um, after I had kind of gone through through those channels, um, which really helped me. You know, every now and then you get like for me, you get an acceptance and and that was more that encouraged me to keep going. Um, so that is a huge part for me of like my, my publishing experience, but in, in publishing this, um, this book, um, I, uh, I would say that again, being in my grad program was, was hugely important. I, I had resources and, and teachers who could help me, um, who could help me, you know, figure out who, how to go about querying how to go about, um, yeah, researching where my, my who my work was right for, um, and also the resources of of those connections. Like I feel like that's important to talk about. Um, really, really helped me and and lifted me up. Um, so I, I I feel like there are a number of ways to answer this question. But um, whenever I talk about publishing, I feel like it's sort of important to be transparent around um, the way those um, kind of personal connections and mentors are kind of integral in, in helping you figure out how to how to do it. And for me, that was that was true. I had been doing the work of writing, you know, privately, you know, leaving work and, and getting my drafts done. Um, I was putting in, in the work, but I, I definitely needed a mentorship. And that is sort of how the ball got rolling for me. So, um, I mean, obviously my first book was a short story collection. And so I was, you know, sort of writing the thing in grad school that I generally wanted to be doing. Um, and I had kind of a weird experience, which was that I had a story. So the story I read from The Husband Stitch came out, which is probably, I, I call it my, like, uh, it's my free bird. It's like what everyone asks. It's just like, it's like, it's like the book, it's like the story of mine that everybody knows, right? And so, um, you know, uh, and it came out in Granta and it was this interesting thing because, you know, Granta actually, they were like, we can't fit it in the magazine, but we'll put it online. And it was like interesting because technically speaking, that's sort of like a demotion. Like it's like, oh, we're not going to put it in the print magazine, but we'll put it online. But what ended up happening was a million bajillion people read that story. And like, I mean, I don't say it didn't, it didn't go, I feel like I can't say it went viral that like now that like, you know, cat person exists um, in the world, but like it did, I mean, for years, it was like their number one hit on their website, like for many years after the story came out. And like, I would get emails from strangers constantly and people would be like, oh my God, I read that story of yours. So there was sort of this weird thing where like, I, even though I didn't have a book out, like I did have this story that had like, just had a lot of sort of, it had, it had a really wide, it, well, big, lots of footprints. It was just kind of all over the place. And so, um, and sort of. I was sort of, so I sort of like became, it was like this publication that kind of like kind of put me out there a little bit. Um, and that was like many years after, that was like three or four years after grad school. Um, and then in terms of the 
book, I mean, I had this kind of also odd process where like, um, I don't know if Kirsten will have a, a similar experience, um, but like, you know, a lot of agents and editors were like, well, do you have a novel? Like, okay, your short stories are fine, but do you have a novel? And I was like, I don't have a novel. I don't even know how to write it. I still don't know how to write a novel, you know? Um, and I was like, I just have this collection, but it's really good and it's done, you know, it's like ready to go. Um, and we went on, my agent went and I went out on submission. Like I eventually, you know, I got an agent, we went out and Grey Wolf was the only house that made an offer on it out of like 30 plus houses. Um, but the cool thing is that you only need one, right? Like in Grey Wolf was this like incredible publisher who put like so much energy into that book. And I loved my editor and I loved every moment of that experience. It was really great. And I felt really like loved and cared for. Um, and then the book was out in the world. Um, and it was really exciting and terrifying and all those things, but yeah, um, short stories. <laughs> <laughs> So I, when I was in graduate school and also after, um, I, I really sort of avoided thinking about publishing. I was, I just was like, I just need to keep my head down and um, work on the stories, um, mostly because it just seemed like such a terrifying and, and foreign world. And I didn't even know how to begin to even think about it. So I chose not to. Um, my first published story was actually published through um, an AWP award. Um, my my grad program submitted a story of mine. I don't think I even knew that they did. Um, I, they, 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 they didn't ask me. Um, and I, my advisor called me and was like, you, you, you know, you're, you're being published. So it was published in, in um, the Colorado Review because of um, this AWP award. And that was really exciting. And also I'd played no part in it. So um, I, I didn't learn a whole lot about the, the process from that. Um, I think, you know, just to echo what Raven said, I, you know, I really was so fortunate to have mentors who who helped me out and and connected me my um graduate school mentor um put me in touch with his agent and she's she's my agent and has been since the beginning and is wonderful and that changed my life um and yeah i too i too was working on stories and i had a completed collection and i did i did at the, when by the time we went to shop the book i had a beginning of a novel i think i'd written 150 pages but i had like 50 polished pages that we we went out with um and several places said you know we'd love to lead with the novel um and then after we'll publish your start, short story collection and I thought, but the, it doesn't exist. <laughs> there, um, there, there actually is no novel, and um, I was, I was so lucky that Norton um, was excited about the stories, which you know actually did exist. And um, I'm so glad we didn't wait on a novel. I, I couldn't have waited because I, I would never have gotten a teaching job. I never, I never, you know, my novel took me ten years to write. Um, so it's. Um, yeah, I was, I was so grateful that my book found a home that really did value short stories, um, and, and they continue to. So, um, you, you've all won a bunch of awards right off the bat and, and received massive critical acclaim. Um, I'm wondering how, you know, how that changed your lives and also if it affected your work and, and your and your writing process it, if, if you're still able to go to the same place to to generate or if, if that's changed at all or or evolved in some way i would say that it's changed my life enormously <laughs> like entirely um where it, i've so I'm, I've been able to write um, full time um, since the book came out. And, and even then I was really kind of hesitant to, to make that leap because I have just been, you know, I've always had like a stable nine to five job. 
Um, and I've always, I've always needed one. Um, and so the, the, the biggest difference, which is like an enormous difference was that I, I was able to, not even in grad school that I, I was I able to have that time. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm able to, to write full time. Um, and, and like the more concrete, you know, in more concrete ways, able to kind of, um, help my family. And I don't know if that's, you know, what you're asking, but it has made like an enormous difference in my life. Um, not just in terms of my writing, <laughs> but in terms of like, um, my family. Um, and it has changed how I, how I write though. I would say like, it is both the, um, the, the kind of privilege of time, but also the fact of having work out there in the world now, I, I think it just sort of, it just changes the way you arrive at the page. Um, so it is, it's an entirely different, um, is an entirely different um, feeling when I when I'm when I sit down to write, and I think partly because for me writing always was the safest place I had. Um, it was the place that I felt that I um, was most in control, but also could be uh, could make you know there was way more room for error there too. You know, like I could I felt a different freedom that I generally don't feel outside of the page. And, and part of that safety was um, the sense of privacy <laughs> that I felt in those drafts. And, and so now I would say that, um, that that aspect has changed a bit. So that has changed how, how, um, how it feels when I sit down. But I, I would say that, I mean, like the, it has changed my life and that I, I have time. Like I, I, don't, I don't enter that panic that I was talking about earlier. I have, and it is just, um, I don't think I'll ever really be entirely used to it, but um, uh, yeah, it, it's just, it's it's changed the the time that I have to do it. And so it, it has changed the actual, the words that come out of me. Um, so it, the whole entire um, life around it has changed. I mean, I feel, I guess, very similarly. I also recently began the process of like not having a nine to five anymore um, or not having a, a, a full time job, which was like really terrifying to like make that decision, um, but also is like really freeing in its own way. Um, I mean, yeah, my first book changed, also like changed my life in dramatic way. As uh, we're coming up on five years this fall of five years since my first book came out, and it really did like. I, it's so weird. It's like I, <laughs> it's like I know I had this different life before, but yeah, it really did change. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do, yeah, it has a lot to do with like being a persona, like being a person who like kind of exists. Like when your work is sort of out in the world, like you do have a different relationship with like yeah, like privacy and like just sort of like you know being the figure that you are. Um, and I do feel like also I had this experience. I don't know if Raven or Kirsten had this experience, but. I feel like when my first book came out or when I was, when I sold it, I like couldn't see past it. Like I was like, maybe I only have one book in me and this is the book. And like, you know, it felt like the, you know, the, the culmination of the dream of like little Carm, like desperately wanted to write a book. And it's like, okay, that's, that's the thing. I did the thing. And I sort of was like, I can't imagine like conceiving even a second book or a third book or whatever. Like, um, and so I, there was this kind of weird experience. And then at some point I remember like having an idea for a new story. And I was like, oh, I do have ideas past this book that I have just sold. And I remember like having a thought, like writing a story. Actually, I think it actually might've been when I met, because I met Kirsten at a residency like a million years ago. And I remember like at that residency, like writing a story and I could have stuck it in this first book. Like I was just under the wire and I, but I was like, no, I think it's a different book and I'm going to just hold on to this story. And like, it'll be in another collection that I'll publish one day. And like having this like just intense revelation about like, oh, like I can do this over and over again. And I can like also challenge myself and give myself new projects and new assignments and like new ways of thinking. And like, I have different ideas than I had. And like, you know, this is also a book. I mean, it's funny reading from it now, like I'm 35, almost 36. And like, I wrote this book in my twenties and like, it feels like the book of a totally different writer. Like I look at it and I'm like, I love it. I'm really proud of it. But also I'm like, man, I feel like totally different, a totally different writer than the writer who wrote this book. And also I could like see all the problems with it. I like edit it when I'm reading through it. I'm like, oh, I, I have all these things that I would change if I could go back, but I can't. Um, so it's also, yeah, like it's a weird, it's, a, I have kind of a weird relationship with it, but no, it's like, yeah, it really did like change my life. And 
yeah, it changed the way that I just approach all of my stuff, but I get to like kind of have my practice on my own terms, which is like a thing that I'm incredibly grateful for, for this, this book and the success that it had. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll echo a lot of what Raven and Carmen have said. Um, I think you know the the biggest thing for me was just this sense that people had faith in my work and that my that you know that it it resonated with with some people, which made a huge difference. Um, as as I wrote, you know, was working on my second book and. You know, because in any any long project, you you uh, you know you get discouraged, and <laughs> it feels like it will never be a book. It will never come together. And I think that that kind of um, attention is something that you know. It's I, I feel like I have a little basket of like nice things people have said about my book, and you can draw on that when when you need. Um, need encouragement and so yeah the, I, I think the faith in my work was the really the biggest thing i mean um you know the the attention was so great um although i i will say it's i think one of the ways i'm able to write and take risks on the page is by telling myself that um, no one will ever see what i'm writing <laughs> and and it's the only way that i can really do it um and feel feel safe writing it um and you know as as you know uh, um i sort of really felt like a writer in the world um i that it gets harder to hold on to that because there there is pressure for the next book and i you know so it's it um and i'm already you know i have readers who I'm picturing looking at this like horrible imperfect draft on my computer and um so it, that that can make it uh, that can be a little tricky but um no by by and large um you know just the yeah the knowledge that that you know there are people out there who may pick it up um is is so heartening let's let's talk about literary life during the pandemic. I know Raven, your book came out um, during the first year of it. Was it August, 2020? Um, I, I remember seeing it, I think in, in March that year in, in galleys. Um, so would, would have been, I assume a totally virtual launch. Yes. Um, so what what has this been been like for, for all of you and how, you know, what what ways have you found to to cope and to keep a sense of community and, and and how does it how does it affect your your writing life um and 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 also just your your career and 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 day to day responsibilities as as an author and where do you where do you see it going? You mean. Oh making work within the pandemic or or doing the work of, of writing and can you I guess that was like a seven part question but, <laughs> but mainly I'm just curious about how how it's affected you and 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 you know what, what you've done to kind of adjust to it definitely I mean so because it was my debut I, I never knew anything different and, and so there there was an aspect of and I feel like we've you know we've been here in this moment for a bit, um, but there is an aspect of uh, how we, what we had to pivot to in order to accommodate um, like book events where, you know, as we're doing right now, there is kind of like, we're not all in the same room together, but there is, that does feel like a, a different kind of intimacy that I began to ap appreciate. Um, and though, though the tricky, there are obviously many tricky parts around, um, around coming out around then, especially in the months where we weren't really sure how to what to call it, how to grapple with it, um, now I feel like kind of like we have a system. Um, but I so there is a lot of of trial and error. I know just for me because it was my de debut, I was extremely extremely nervous. <laughs> no matter what form it would have. 
taken. I, I was nervous. And so um, I felt this, you know, this, there's an enormous um, thing happening behind this thing that um, I'd, I'd really worked. Uh, so many people along with me had worked to, to make happen. Um, but an awareness that there is something really sad and scary happening. I was, I did struggle to balance how to be during that time. And, and I've, I've talked about this a bit, um, but it was sort of my reality in pu publishing my book. My, my dad, um, he died from COVID and my brother, like shortly after, um, he was really ill. And so I was sort of dealing with COVID in a, in a personal way. Um, and also kind of not being able to things that we had had to go through when you're, you know, perhaps when someone you're close to um, is ailing, the protocol around COVID changed how you could see them, when you could see them. And so I, I had a lot of um, a lot of that happening in the background <laughs> as, as this kind of, this thing that I cared a lot about um, was in the world. And so it was, it was uh, difficult balancing both. It was really difficult, um, but, uh, and, and I didn't really, so I didn't know what I was missing because it was all I'd known. Um, and I felt like we all banded together around art <laughs> and that felt really beautiful. Um, but I will say, uh, before I left New York, I had, um, I, I had one, uh, in-person event <laughs> in, in Brooklyn at Powerhouse where, uh, I, I read in grad school. So it was really, really, um, um, it was really special and it was it was that moment where i was in the room with surrounded by people where i was like oh this is what it feels like and i could i had a longing <laughs> i did then have a longing to to experience that more because it just is a different feeling especially if you're you know you're reading jokes from your book <laughs> over zoom <laughs> to dead silence like there, there are all these things that you could say you know you're, you're dealing with the like the kind of most uppercase elements of human drama, you know, in the middle of the pandemic um, and, and trying to figure out where your kind of little piece of art fits. And um, it was, it was, it was both, it was like, it was a, there were parts that were difficult and there were parts that were really beautiful, at, but ultimately it was, and it's still an incredible thing that in the middle of that, um, people really cared to, you know, engage with my work. That was, and still is um, incredible. Yeah, so <clears throat> I um, I feel like I, I, I kind of have been darkly joking that I, I made COVID happen because I was on tour for my memoir and it was really hard and difficult. And I was extremely stressed out and like not doing great and was touring kind of all over. And I had a thought, I thought, man, I would give anything for this tour to just be over. <laughs> <laughs> so I apologize for the pandemic, which I clearly brought upon all of us. Um, and yeah, and then I went from being like just booked out for months to just like nothing, like just this, it was just, it was wild. I mean, it was like really fast and so it was this odd experience and you, and I I will say that I do I mean that tour was hard because the book was difficult but I do generally love events I love getting to read I mean what Raven was talking about like that energy in the room like I I I truly loathe online events as I say on a computer <laughs> like because I do feel like there is that energy it's like knowing if your jokes are landing or knowing if like people are like I just feel like I, I've been in so many rooms at readings where like either I've been reading or someone else has been reading where you can just like hear the audience like responding to something that's happening you can just feel that like energy in the room like there's just something really special and magical about like I mean, it's church, right? It's like people like coming together to a single space to like participate in this like shared experience. Um, and it's sort of, it is like weird how like, I mean, there's like pieces of, you can do an event online, but you're not gonna have that like feeling, right? Um, and so, yeah, so there is something really like interesting about that. And I did really get, like I was, I, that is like the thing I miss probably the most. Um, and I feel very lucky in that like, for me, like COVID was difficult, but like, I didn't, like, I didn't lose anyone close to me. Like, you know, I, my family stayed pretty healthy. Like everything was mostly okay. But of course, you know, just, there was also just the experience of like writing was really hard because I realized that like so much energy in my life comes from like going out, like 
getting on public transit and like going to therapy and going to the grocery store and like going out into the world. And like, there's a lot of sort of energy generated by just like being out, like being in the world as a person. And so when I was like sitting in my house every single day, just like being in the same place nonstop, I think it really like my brain just felt kind of like closed down and I was like really struggling to, to write. Um, I was just doing like jigsaw puzzles <laughs> like, uh, and like, play Animal Crossing. I mean, it was like really bad. I, I was just really, and, like, I, and everyone, I was seeing all these memes, people were like, well, you should be finishing your novel. And I was like, shut up. No, I, no I'm not. <laughs> like, leave me alone. <laughs> so yeah, so I just, I don't know. It was like, I mean, it, it was and remains obviously like horrible and very stressful and like difficult. And I feel like now I am in terms of my own like mental health and writing for capacity kind of climbing out of it. Um, like I am writing new work now. Like I finally feel kind of ready to do that. But also not coincidentally, I'm like able to like move around in the world a little more easier. And there's just like the, like, you know, the way it is, is really different. Um, but yeah, no, it was like a very, it was certainly like a really strange experience. I mean, and I missed, yeah, I really did miss, I think more than anything, like the, the human contact of just like doing events, meeting writers, meeting readers, like going to school. Like I'm right now, I'm actually in, I'm in a hotel room right now. I'm like in Alabama, like doing a school visit. And I love, I'm so happy. I'm just like, I'm just like, oh, talking to people in person is like the best feeling in the world. So, yeah. It really is. I mean, there's something so wonderful about, yeah, being in a room with, with other people and sharing the same experience. Um, I, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm heartened and sorry also that you had trouble writing and concentrating Carmen um but I'm heartened by it because I've I've felt so much shame around the fact that I I felt like my brain just ground to a halt I I mean I wasn't even reading for it's I think the first time in my life that I I couldn't even listen to audiobooks. I mean, I would start and I was I was this was not high literature that I was listening to. It was like thrillers and I would lose track, you know, two sentences in. Um and and that lasted for a really long time and you know, I I did feel pretty I felt bad about myself because, you know, so many of my friends were writing novels and <laughs> you know, had these big projects that they were you know, making such headway on. Um, and I did eventually get back into reading and it was through poetry. Like that, that's what got me back into reading. And um, I'm so grateful for that. I, I don't think I've ever read as much poetry in my life. Um, but it, you know, it remained in hard. It's it's still hard. My, my family also um, had losses and we um uh, almost everyone got got sick um and um so that that feels um yeah i mean that that remains hard um i think i was lucky at the beginning of the pandemic because i was on the copy edits phase of my book and you know that's just like busy work that needs to happen. And it was torture to do it. I mean, I it, it felt like such an impossible project when, you know, really it's just like going through line by line. Um, but I, I, I am grateful that I had that sort of level of work to do um, because I, I, I mean, I certainly wasn't writing. Um, I've, I've begun, I've begun, you know, in the last, um, really it was the last six months um, that I, I started, you know, writing new stuff that felt, you know, it felt like there was some energy and urgency to, um, and it wasn't, um, and I'm, I'm so relieved because part of me worried that it was gone forever. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's coming back, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's what a what a hard thing for just everyone. I mean, the entire planet to face this this sort of level of loss is really hard to wrap wrap my head around. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So we, when this is presented during the conference, it will be no secret to the audience that it will not be live. Um, but that means that there won't be any questions from the audience. But um, does any do any of you have a question for anyone else? We have um, about seven minutes, and I think that could be a fun way to fill it. Maybe we could talk about what we're working on next. That that would be great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's okay. Great. If, if you guys yeah. will yeah. do it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's it was kind of heartening hearing Kirsten talk about like the moment of the feeling of maybe it's gone because <laughs> I was definitely in a moment like that for a, a while, um, and and even hearing about the, the jigsaw puzzles, like I mean, also psychically there <laughs> too. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I, I am still like, it's funny, I am a lapsed Seventh-day Adventist and the only woo-woo I have now is around writing. So I, I, don't, I don't talk super much about it, but I am working on something, I'm a novel I'm excited about now um, that actually has to do uh, a bit with faith, <laughs> ironically prefaced it that way. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm working on a, a new novel and it is going slowly. Um, still, you know, it's it's going slowly, even though it is back, thank God. But um, the the way of writing has changed for me. And I think for a moment, it just took um, it it took a moment to realize that that change was OK. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm working on a novel and so far it's going well. <laughs> Raven, is it too much to ask um, if it's set? partly in, in upstate as, as Lester was. <laughs> you know what's funny is I keep on swapping, but yeah, some of the original it's yeah, it's there's some Latham in it, there's some Albine in it. So please look out for that. <laughs> uh, certainly well there, there's there's not enough literature from from the upstate region. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Th thank you for providing. Um so I'm also working on a new book. Um and it's actually based on like a challenge I gave myself a few years ago, which was, I was like really afraid of research, like for fiction. Like I was like really afraid of like historical fiction basically. Um, and my spouse is writing historical fiction and just is like researching constantly. And it's like really amazing to watch like research get translated into, you know, fiction and characters. And um, and so I was like, that's a thing you need to, you need to like make yourself do that. And so I began to like attempt to do a bunch of historical stories. And I have a book now that's like a mix of contemporary and historical stories and like a shared universe um, that will be coming out at some point when I finish it, I suppose. But yeah, that I also, it was like a book that I was working on COVID broke my brain. I also like could not read or do anything productive for like a really long time. And like in the last, yeah, like, yeah, in the last like four months, I'd say I suddenly was able to like kind of get back and I just finished like a new story and I just started another story and it's like kind of moving along. Um, so it's exciting. And I'm like, I'm just saying, it feels so good to write again. Like I also really was concerned that like, I was just, yeah, like never gonna be able to do it again. And um, Cause yeah, it really was just like so hard to just like <laughs> do anything. It's funny that you mentioned, um, Kirsten, you mentioned you were doing audio, but well, you knew you said you couldn't do audiobooks. What was the thing you said you could do? Oh, poetry. Um, Cause I also, the only thing I was really able to read were graphic novels. Like there was something about like the, 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 the that quality, the quality of it being sort of partially visual that I didn't, it was like easier for me to read than like, just like prose. Um, but yeah, so anyway, but yeah, so new, a new short story collection. Um, that hopefully I will finish soon. Sounds great. Yeah, Kirsten. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm. When I when I started, um, you know, getting getting back into writing again, I was I I started writing some stories and actually essays as well, um, which um, feels very scary to me, and I don't know that they'll that all those will ever be seen by human eyes other than mine but um yeah it's it's fun to be back back in stories especially after you know just putting this novel that took me forever to write out in the world um yeah great well well thank you all so much for for all of your your generous answers and, and great conversation and, and great readings 
I've enjoyed this immensely and I'm really happy we could do this. Thank you all. Thank you all. This was such a joy. Yeah, it was so nice. And thanks to the National Book Critics Circle for yes. convening us. Yes.